Hello, this is Nightline and I'm Nakia Basharudin, news making the headlines. Government considering selling stakes in Petronas to states. An SRC trial that the Sri Najib tells court he sacked Muhyiddin Shafi for making statements outside cabinet. Welcome. The government is considering selling stakes in energy giant Petronas to states where the company's oil and gas fields are in a bid to raise funds for the debt-laden government. Prime Minister Tun Dr. Mahathir Mohamad in an interview with Reuters on Tuesday said such a move may also give states such as Sarawak and Sabah a say in the running of Petronas, the world's third largest exporter of liquefied natural gas. Sun Dr. Mahade said the government could not meet a demand made by the state for a quadrupling of the royalties paid by the company to 20 percent of its profit. You can, we can. It's fully owned by the government. It's up to the government to sell the shares uh, pri privately, not in the market, privately to uh, states like Sarawak and Sabah. How much stake are you offer, would you offer to them? Uh, have, you, have you discussed that with them already? Well, Petronas is a very big company. Right. It depends on how much they can pay also. Mm -hmm. But of course, we want to retain Petronas as a Fortune 500 company. Yeah. We can't uh, just sell off in order to raise cash or things like that. Yeah. So that has to be done very carefully yeah. so as not to affect the status of Petronas. Sarawak and Sabah have Malaysia's most prolific oil and gas reserves in their waters in the South China Sea. Their long-standing demand to increase royalties could cost Petronas up to 7 billion U.S. dollars a year. Petronas, formerly known as Petroleum National Berhad, is the biggest money spinner for the federal government. Tundok Tamade said the government could also cut stakes in smaller listed or unlisted units of Petronas. The company's main listed units are petrochemicals maker Petronas Chemicals Group, retail arm Petronas Dagagan, and gas infrastructure and utilities arm Petronas Gas. Petronas Charigali is its exploration unit. On another issue, Tun Dr. Mahade said he is hopeful of reaching an out-of-court settlement with Goldman Sachs over the 1MDB scandal soon. But that compensation of one-point-something billion dollars offered by the bank was too small. Uh, we would uh, like to avoid having go to the courts. But if they come up with a reasonable sum, I think we will agree. But at the moment, their offer is too small. So we are continuing to talk with them to explain why they should pay what we demand. Of course, uh, it's not the full amount. They may be able to prune it down. But we think that we can reach some agreement at a later stage. Malaysia has charged Goldman and 17 current and former directors of its units for allegedly misleading investors over bond sales totaling 6.5 billion US dollars that the US bank helped raise for sovereign wealth fund 1MDB. Tun Dr. Mare said they have demanded 7.5 billion US dollars from Goldman and negotiations were ongoing. A spokesman for Goldman declined to comment. On to Dato Sri Muhammad Najib Tun Razak's SRC international trial. The former Prime Minister testified in court on Tuesday that he removed Tan Sri Muhyiddin Yassin and Dato Sri Shafi, Shafi'i Abdal from his cabinet in 2015 as they were openly critical of his administration's handling of 1MDB. He said it was not because they had raised their concerns over the sovereign wealth fund. Under cross-examination by Attorney General Tan Sri Tommy Thomas, Datuk Sri Najib agreed to the suggestion that it was his prerogative as the then Prime Minister to select and remove cabinet members. He, however, rejected Tan Sri Tommy's suggestion that he would have removed Tan Sri Muhyiddin and Datuk Sri Shafi as ministers if they had raised their concerns within cabinet meetings. 
Earlier, Dat Sri Najib said there was a price to pay in exercising his prerogative and that he subsequently paid for it but did not elaborate. According to the principle of collective responsibility, cabinet members are obliged to publicly support the decisions they make collectively, and any who could not abide by this should resign. Dr. Sri Najib also stressed that he was not the first prime minister to remove a minister. The court also heard that Dr. Sri Najib appointed himself a finance minister as he felt that he was able to improve the country's economy. When suggested by Tan Sri Thomas that he appointed himself as finance minister to secure government guarantees for 1MDB and its subsidiaries, Dr. Sri Najib disagreed. Dr. Sri Najib also told the High Court that he bought the 466,000 ringgit luxury watch for his wife's birthday to make it up for having to leave a family holiday early. The watch, he said, was chosen by Datin Sri Rosma Manso herself. Dr. Sri Najib said he had to leave early as he had to return to Malaysia because Kelantan was hit with a terrible flood. He added his son, Noor Ashman, who was working in Istanbul, Turkey, had flown to Honolulu only to find out he was no longer there. Because of this, Dr. Sri Najib said he decided to buy something that was chosen by his wife. To another question by his lead counsel, Tan Sri Muhammad Shafi Abdullah, Dr. Sri Najib said the watch was the only purchase that was personal in nature bought by credit card. A witness told former Deputy Prime Minister Dr. Sri Ahmad Zahid Hamidi's corruption and criminal breach of trust trial that the company he was previously attached to had received 360,000 ringgit from Yayasan Akal Budi. Yayasan Akal Budi is a charitable foundation set up by Dr. Sri Zahid. Jasni Majid said his previous company, TS Consultancy and Resources, had received two checks from the foundation for 360,000 ringgit on August 20, 2015 and December 23, 2016, for having conducted the registration of voters for a special unit under the Deputy Prime Minister's office. He said both checks were issued from Yayasan Akalbudi's Afin Bank account and that he and another staff had deposited the checks into their company's CIMB account. Jasni said the company had sought funds from Dr. Sri Zahid as it did not have enough money to run its activities and daily operations. To a question from Deputy Public Prosecutor Ahmad Sazali Abdul Khairi as to why the company had to get funds from a third party, Jasni said the company did not have any income. Asked by Datuk Sri Zahid's lawyer, Hamidi Muhammad No, whether he knew that TS Consultancy was meant to print Quran books and that the 360,000 ringgit was paid for this purpose, Jasni said he was not aware of it. Earlier, a trustee of Yayasan Akalbudi admitted in court to having signed a statutory declaration with untrue information about the payment of Datuk Sri Zahid's credit card bills. Datuk Khairuddin Tarmizi said he signed the SD voluntarily after a lawyer known as Murali explained to him that the monies had been paid back by Datuk Sri Zahid to the foundation. However, he said he did not receive any payment from Datuk Sri Zahid when asked by Deputy Public Prosecutor Raja Rosella Rajatoran. Datuk Sri Zahid faces 47 charges over alleged CBT involving Yayasan Akalbudi funds, money laundering as well as accepting bribes for various projects during his tenure as Home Minister. The hearing before High Court Judge Colin Lawrence Sakara continues on Wednesday. Over 1.5 million civil servants at grade 56 and below will receive a special financial aid payout of 500 ringgit each on December 18th. Finance Minister Lim Guan Eng said 1 million retirees, including veterans and non-pensionable government retirees, will also receive a special payment of 250 ringgit. In a statement, Lim said the special payment will involve an allocation of 1 billion ringgit. Similar to last year, the special finance assistance will be paid before year end, and this, among others, to assist public sector workers who are parents to prepare for the upcoming school term. The special payment was announced during the tabling of Budget 2020 on October 11th. 
A marine debris policy will be established to holistically address plastic waste polluting the seas and beaches. According to Energy, Science, Technology, Environment and Climate Change Minister Yo Bi Yin, such pollution is attributed to ineffective plastic waste management. Polisi ini akan membantu mengawal isu ini dengan lebih menyeluruh di, di samping tindakan tegas yang sedang diambil oleh Jabatan Alam Sekitar. Langkah ini adalah selaras dengan Bangkok Declaration on Combating Marine Debris in ASEAN Region and dan ASEAN Framework of Action on Marine Debris yang telah pun diumumkan pada 22 Jun 2019 semasa sidang kemuncak ASEAN di Bangkok, uh, Thailand. Mestek adalah focal point untuk ASEAN Declaration on Combating uh, Debris in ASEAN Region. Yeo said this in response to a question from Senator Dr. Ahmad Azam Hamza on the direction the government was taking in regulating the use of plastic, which was polluting the environment, particularly marine life. She also added that the government is actively mounting multi-agency operations at major ports across the country as part of efforts to prevent the illegal import of plastic waste, as well as enforcement against plastic recycling factories, which are operating without licenses or in contravention of the law. In connection to this, a total of 175 such factories which had contravened the Environmental Quality Act 1974 have been forced to stop their operations as part of enforcement activities conducted until November 30th. Deputy Prime Minister Dr. Wan Aziza Wan Ismail's father, Dr. Wan Ismail Wan Mahmoud, has been laid to rest at 11.15 Tuesday morning in Ampang. He was 93 when he died from a heart attack at his residence in Taman Nirwana, Ampang, at 2.30 a.m. Earlier, his body was brought to Masjid Al Mustaqim, Taman Nirwana, at 9 a.m. for his final rites. Also present at the mosque were Datuk Sri Dr. Wan Aziza, her husband Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim, and their daughters Pramatang Pau MP Nurul Iza Anwar and Nurul Ilham. The Prime Minister also paid his respects, along with Defence Minister Muhammad Sabu, Water, Land and Natural Resources Minister Xavier Jayakumar, as well as Finance Minister Lim Guan Eng. Dr. Wan Ismail, who was previously served in the Home Ministry during Tun Abdul Razak's era, leaves behind his wife, Datin Maria Kamis, and four daughters, including Datuk Sri Dr. Wan Aziza, and a son. Online scam syndicate crippled in Ipoh. This and more home stories when we return. Welcome back. At least one Malaysian has been confirmed dead after a volcano erupted on White Island, New Zealand on Monday. The Malaysian High Commission in Wellington said in a Facebook post on Tuesday that it was informed of the death by local officials, with New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern confirming the matter. According to Arden, reconnaissance flights showed no signs of life on the island. Um, at this stage, we can confirm that amongst those currently listed as missing or injured are New Zealanders who were part of the tour operation and tourists from Australia, the United States, the United Kingdom, China and Malaysia. That is to the best of our knowledge. The number of confirmed fatalities in the eruption rose to six Tuesday night after an injured person died in an Auckland hospital. Eight people were still missing after White Island, one of New Zealand's most active volcanoes, spewed a plume of ash 3,668 metres into the sky. Meanwhile, the remains of the four members of a Malaysian family who were killed in a road accident in New Zealand has been laid to rest in Christchurch on Tuesday. The victims were buried at the Memorial Park Cemetery in Christchurch at about 12.30 p.m. local time. This was confirmed by the late Dr. Rumihati Abdul Hamid's brother-in-law, Shaifuddin Daud, when met at the family home in Kampung Ulu Putatan Tuesday morning. Shortly before the burial, funeral prayers were held at the Christchurch Mosque, which was attended by Dr. Rumihati's elder brother, Othman Abdul Hamid, and several family members. 
The funeral arrangements were conducted with the assistance of the Canterbury Muslim Association and the mosque congregation. A simultaneous prayer was also held in Kampung Ulu Putatan, which was participated by about 20 family members and relatives of the victims. Kami ingin mengucapkan terima kasih, jutaan terima kasih kepada rakyat Malaysia yang telah membantu untuk meringankan beban keluarga kami dalam menghadapi sah-sah ini dan adalah dimaklumkan um, proses pengkebumian jenazah di Kerajaan di New Zealand telah pun uh, selesai. The family from Sabah had gone for a holiday in New Zealand when they were involved in an accident on State Highway 1 in Kaikoura, New Zealand, last Friday. The victims were Dr. Rumihati Abdul Hamid, her husband, Adanan Jemain, both aged 49 years, and their daughters, Nur Irfan, 15, and Maisara Arifa, 13. The couple's youngest child, Nur Arifa Bahia, 11, who survived the incident and is receiving treatment at the Wellington Hospital, has regained consciousness. The burial in Christchurch was held on the request of family members. The Para Immigration Department has detained 40 Chinese nationals in Ipoh on Monday. They are believed to have been the remaining suspects who had escaped during an operation in Cyberjaya last month that crippled an online scam syndicate. Authorities conducted a surveillance on a bungalow at Jalan Tun Dr. Ismail before finally swooping in to detain 38 men and two women aged between 18 and 54. A further inspection on the house found that it had been used to operate online scam activities for the last two weeks. They also seized 80 smartphones, computers, high-tech routers, cash in various currencies, bank cards and Chinese identification documents. Selain daripada tempat tinggal dan tempat makan, tempat tidur dan juga menjalankan aktiviti aa, penipuan ni kita dapat, kita juga turut menyumpai kondom-kondom berpuluh-puluh kondom yang masih belum digunakan dan juga yang telah digunakan maknanya jadi one stop center lah kita ada tahan dua wanita mungkin ada di antaranya mereka ni di tempat pelepas nak bersulah in a previous raid on November 20th in Cyberjaya, 680 Chinese nationals were detained while 100 others managed to flee Gunman opens fire at a hospital before shooting himself. The details after this break. We're back with the foreign news. A Chilean Air Force plane with 38 people aboard that went missing Monday night on its way to Antarctica is presumed to have crashed. A search and rescue mission was already underway involving the air and maritime forces in the area of the plane's last known location. According to the Air Force, the C-130 Hercules aircraft had departed at 4.55 p.m. local time from Punta Arenas, heading towards the country's Antarctic base, before losing radio contact around 6 p.m. local time near the Drake Passage, with no emergency signals having been activated. Its last known position was about 390 nautical miles from Punta Arenas and 280 nautical miles from the Antarctic base. The C-130 Hercules was carrying 17 crew and 21 passengers, including three civilians. They were being flown in to check on a floating fuel supply line and other equipment at the Chilean base. A gunman killed six people on Tuesday at a hospital waiting room in the eastern Czech city of Ostrava before fleeing and fatally shooting himself in the head after he was tracked down by police. According to the police, the shooting had occurred just after 7 a.m. local time at the trauma ward of the University Hospital, which is located around 300 kilometers east of Prague. It is understood that the 42-year-old shooter gunned down four men and two women at close range before he fled the scene. 
The suspect was later found dead from a self-inflicted gunshot wound in a vehicle three hours after the attack. The shooter's identity and motive remains unknown, and police investigations revealed that the man had used an unregistered weapon. Latest updates from the 30th Sea Games. Don't go away. We're back with sports, the 30th Sea Games. The Malaysian contingent's hopes of achieving their 70 gold medal target were dashed after only managing to grab four gold medals on the 10th day. This brings the total gold medal tally to 55 on Tuesday with only one day left. The first gold medal of the day came from the athletics event when Muhammad Hakimi Ismail has now cemented his status as the undisputed triple jump champion in the region after grabbing his third successive SEA Games gold in the event. The 28-year-old father recorded a season's best of 16.68 meters in his third jump to pip Philippines' Mark Harry Dionis and Indonesian athlete Sapwa Turaham for the gold. Muhammad Hakimi's focus now will shift to his attempt to qualify for the 2020 Tokyo Olympics through several international meets early next year. The second gold medal also came from the athletics after Shamsuddin Muhammad Irfan bagged the gold in the men's discus throw event. Shamsuddin recorded a 57.29 meters throw to clinch the gold, beating Philippines' Morrison William and Thailand's Benadron Narong, who took silver and bronze respectively. Meanwhile, the national indoor hockey squad put on an impressive display after winning gold in both men's and women's event. The Malaysian women's indoor hockey team exacted sweet revenge over defending champions Thailand to claim the SEA Games gold medal with a 2-0 shootout win in the final after a one-all draw in the regulation period. As for in the men's event, the national retained the gold after beating Thailand 3-1 in the final. In Scotland, the streets of Glasgow's city centre were painted red recently with thousands of runners and walkers and plenty of dogs dressed as Santa Claus as they took part in the annual Santa Dash organised by Glasgow City Council to raise money for charities. With that, I'm Nakia Bashirudin. Thank you for tuning in and take care.